also from New Zealand. Uh, thank you very much for backing the show. Hi. Um, also, I'd like to thank Arts Council England for backing this show. Um, just so that you know, there's going to be an interval of 15 minutes. Um, we'd love to get your feedback. Please do fill in the uh, feedback forms. If you haven't got one, please get one. We, I'd like to hear your comments as the director of the show. Uh, the other thing is, after the show, we've got a talk back with Laura Bates, who's the founder of the Everyday Sexism Project. And um, that will happen straight after the show. Um, so it'll be about 15 to 20 minutes where we'll be talking about uh, her project. And then I open it up to the world and also to you uh, <laughs> live audience here. So do enjoy the show and I look forward to getting your comments. Thank you very much. Nobody believes 
that I was a soldier. And do you know why? Because I'm female. Blessed are those who observe justice, who do righteousness at all times. When I was a freshman in high school, I vowed I'd never be in the army. I wanted to go to college, you know? But my parents are real religious. Clara, you don't need to go to college. You can do God's work better in the army. <laughs> it's strange, because she and my dad went to college, but they told me I didn't need to go. I was working as a cook in Bible camp in the summers, and I saw how I could make kids happy doing that. So I thought maybe Mama was right. Maybe serving food in the Army would give me a mission to spread the word of God. So she took me to the recruitment office. I was just 16 then. They gave me the test that shows what kind of jobs you can do in the military. My score suggested that I could be a nurse. I wasn't sure about that. All I'd ever wanted to be was a teacher. But then the recruiter started calling my house all the time. And one day this recruiter came to my home. He was three years older than me, a model, picture guy, you know, blonde, blue eyed, so handsome in his uniform. He told me I could be a chaplain's assistant. And that appealed to me because it was religious. And he was one of those perfect guys, you know? So I joined the reserves. Mama signed the waiver because I wasn't 17 yet. It was 2004 by then, but Mama and me weren't worried about the war. We knew you could die just as easily crossing the street. It's all in God's plan when you die, whether you go to war or not. Name is Terrace, Sergeant DeWalt Johnson to you. I'm 37 years old and the mother of four kids, two boys and two girls. My home is in Georgia now, but I grew up in DC. My life was pretty Drastic. My stepfather was a drunk. Beat up on my mom all the time. Beat up on me and my brothers and sisters too, but <laughs> he saved the worst of it for her. He hit her with a hammer, lacerated her legs, broke her skull. One time, he stabbed her 13 times with a long kitchen knife. Till the knife sank in so deep he couldn't pull it out again. <laughs> she only survived because she was so fat. By the time I was 13, I went fight him back. I laid him out flat with a baseball bat once. It was, I've got to kill this guy or he is gonna kill my mom. As soon as I could, I moved out. Started living with my boyfriend. He's my husband now. A gentleman and a sweetheart. I've known him since I was nine. And by the time I was 19, we had two kids and I was working two jobs. One at McDonald's and the other selling tour tickets down at Union Station. One day, this recruiter comes up to me. Have you ever thought about signing up? The Army will pay for college, train you in whatever job you want, and you get to travel. Well, I got interested because I'd always wanted to travel. So I joined the Army Reserves, and that enabled us to get out of D.C. D.C. is such a poison place to me. I mean, all you've got there is a bunch of drugs and killing. Three of my brothers were shot to death there for no reason. My son was shot in the feet in a drive-by when he was just five years old, playing in the yard. It's because of the military that my four kids live like they do. We have a nice house, and they go to good schools. So I liked being in the army. Then they sent me to Iraq. I grew up in a small rural town in Wisconsin. It's only about 2,000 people, so pretty much everybody knows everybody. There were two types of people in my town, the people who left and the people who stayed. My way of getting out was to join the Army National Guard when I was 17. A lot of people from my high school were in the military, so it didn't seem like any big deal, but my parents weren't happy about it. I come from a very political household. My dad was an elected official and were Democrats, so I had to really argue with them to get them to sign and let me join. Anna, we just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. But I was stubborn. I thought I wanted to give something back to society, do something for my country, but really, it was a rebellion. When I joined the military, I got an overwhelmingly good response from my community. If I went downtown or to the supermarket in my uniform, people were proud of me. It made me feel like I belonged. 
After all, it was pre-9-11. We all thought differently then. In August 2001, I shipped out to do my training at Fort Jackson, and zero day, the day you meet your drill instructor, turned out to be September 11th. we just finished taking the oath when the sergeant said something about a plane hitting towers, but I couldn't really hear. People were running to the barracks, getting hysterical. The sergeant was saying, We're going to war! We're, We're going, going to war! war! We're, We're going, going to war! war! But I just thought it was part of the training. It took me a couple hours to realize it was real. After that, there were rumors that training would speed up and we'd be sent over. But it didn't happen. Training just went on as normal. We stuck bayonets into man-shaped targets, sang songs about blood and killing, and didn't bat an eye, because we were already desensitized. What makes the green grass go? Blood, blood, bright red blood. What makes the pretty flowers blue? Guts, guts, pretty grimy guts. The real reason somebody killed on the battlefield isn't because of that song. It isn't because we stuck a bayonet into a dummy on the assault force either. It's because our best friend's sitting next to us in the cab, and we don't want him to die. My name's Miriam Ruffalo. I'm 27 and third generation Air Force. My grandfather and father were Air Force officers, and all my life I wanted to be just like him. I joined the Air Force Reserves after high school and put myself through school during my enlistment. I got married too and had a baby girl. My daughter was only two years old when I was deployed. That was March 2003, right as the U.S. was going into Iraq. I had to leave her with my husband. We're divorced now. It was so hard to leave my little girl. I kept worrying about would she be fed right, would she be able to sleep okay. It really hurt to hear her little voice on the phone. Well, I was on active duty for a little over eight years in the Air Force. I was a public affairs specialist, that means combat correspondent, and a photographer. I loved my job. I am Santiago Flores, 46 years old, and retired after 22 years in the Army. I was a drill sergeant who taught other people how to be drill sergeants, so I have a drill sergeant personality. I used to tell my soldiers, I don't give a damn if you don't like me. I am not here to be your friend. You have an idea? You think it'll work? I'm open to that. But you don't mess with Sergeant Flores. Yes, Sergeant! Joining the military is not unusual for Native Americans. It's our way of holding on to the idea of being a warrior being a provider and a protector is something we find great honor and pride in. And nowadays, it is hard to find things that bring honor to your family for natives. Till I was 10, we never lived in one place long enough for me to finish out a grade of school. My dad kept moving to find one job or another, but also because he was trying to run away from his drinking. You know, drinking's a problem for native people. Well, it was no different for my family. Finally, he bought a house and we stayed put. My dad's a supervisor in a bakery, and my mom's a bank teller. I didn't have any ambition after high school, so I joined the Army Military Police, became specialist Sylvia Gonzalez. I did it for the money and the challenge and the discipline. My parents didn't have much of an opinion of me enlisting. That's what I wanted to do, it was fine with them, so mom signed the papers because I was only 17. And then 9-11 happened, and I was mobilized to Iraq. 9-11 made a lot of people proud of being in the military, including me. I was scared. I was glad that I was in an organization that was gonna do something about this. I never thought much about the war in Iraq at first. It really wasn't really my place to get involved with something that I didn't know anything about. The thing that worried me was that I was going to be away from home for a whole year. They gave me notice three weeks before I had to go. And my parents don't deal with things emotionally, so I figured out my stuff and I left. When I was 13, 
My dad brings home this white guy to work for him fixing cars, George. This was 1973, and George was just back from Vietnam. He had one leg shorter than the other, and he spent a whole year in hospital with his wounds. And people said he'd raped girls in Vietnam. I didn't like him at all. But he started being nice to me. Took me to drive a movie, gave me a joint to smoke and something to drink, and then he raped me. And I got pregnant from that rape. My dad was furious. Thought it was all my fault. Didn't care that I was only 13. So he makes me get in the car and we go looking for George. We find him pretty quick. Get in the fucking car, my dad said. He was six feet tall and people did what he said. So George gets in, dad drives us back to the house, sits down at the kitchen table, pulls out a gun, sets it on the table in front of us, and he tells George, you have five minutes and two choices. Either marry my daughter or die. And all I could think was, if my dad shoots George, he's going to go to prison. All of us are going to be without a dad. My mom's going to be without a husband. It'll all be my fault. So I told George I'd marry him. I really hated him. My eldest son is a product of that rape. I love him, but he knows the story and he feels pretty alienated from my family. He hates having a Indian mom because he sees no honor. For the next few years, I'm living with George, and he is beating the crap out of me, and I am turning to drink just like the rest of my family. And when I'm 16, I get pregnant again. Birth control? Nobody told me about that. And I had so much trauma in my life at that point. Who would have thought about that anyway? Finally, at one point, I, I just can't take it anymore, so I decide to kill George and dump him in Lake Tahoe. But he's such a big guy, I can't figure out how I'm going to get his body there. I'm going to have to put him on a boat alive and then kill him. And he's a really strong guy, so I'm thinking, okay, that's not going to work. But by the time I'm 20, George has landed in jail again for attacking me. And I'm divorced at last. So there I am, living in a one-bedroom, cockroach-infested apartment with two kids. And I'm on welfare. So. I'm thinking, what am I going to do? That's when I decide to join the army. you can't win. In Iraq in the beginning, I was considered a hoe because I was nice to people. When I found out what they were saying about me, I became a bitch. I wasn't mean. I just changed so that nobody thought I was being flirty. I changed the way that I walked and the way that I talked. Everything. Nobody over there even knew who I was because I was always putting on an act. A lot of the men didn't want us there. One guy told me that the only reason the military send female soldiers is to provide eye candy for the guys, to keep them sane. In Vietnam, they had prostitutes, but they don't have those in Iraq, so they have women soldiers instead. It was July 2003 by the time I got to Iraq. We were in Fob Spiker, which used to be an Iraqi airbase, and there were huge pictures of Saddam Hussein everywhere. It was spooky. Soldiers would pose next to them and take pictures like tourists. I was attached to an army engineering unit, and 
Our job was to build bases and roads, fix bridges, so we cleaned up the rubble and all kinds of disgusting stuff in the building so we could move in. Excrement, rags, bits of military equipment. We prepared the base, built runways, used scrap metal to make our own armor because we had no armored vehicles. We built a basketball court for ourselves, but we were doing nothing to help the Iraqi people. I was petroleum supply specialist. <coughs> that means I pumped gas. My job was to drive around the base refueling dump trucks, rollers, scrapers, wait for a couple hours, and do it again. When it was busy, it was really busy. And when it was slow, there was absolutely nothing to do. So I wrote a lot of letters, took pictures, threw rocks into a box. My unit was a real good old boys club, though. And I was one of only 19 women out of 141 people. The leadership didn't trust women to do a good job at anything. They were always hovering over you, waiting for you to screw up. Soon you feel like you couldn't do anything right. And the guys had cases of porn, which they'd look at out in the open. They were always calling out things like, Hey, Peterford, I like your tits in that t-shirt. It happened so much you got numb. Finally, after a couple months, I started to go out on missions to rebuild schools. That was the best part of my time there. Then, I began to convoy to other bases. I was driving a 2300 gallon diesel truck, and because it was taking occasional gunfire, it could have burst into flames any moment. It was a bomb on wheels. The Iraqi people were pretty hostile to us by that time. When we went into a town, we were always looking at faces and hands, trying to guess their mood. If they're staring at you, not in fear, but because they hate you, you know you're not wanted. We were told the kids could be dangerous too. They could be a decoy or be carrying a bomb. So if they run in front of the convoy, you're supposed to run them over. I'd been a daycare teacher before I got deployed. And one of the guys on my team who knew this about me said, Ed and I have been talking. If a kid came in front of the convoy, we don't know if you'd be able to run him over. I had to tell him, I don't know if I could either. But then, our first day out, a boy threw a rock at our vehicle. It made a crack, like a bullet. And I knew then that if I had to hit a kid and kill him, I would. Not to save my life, but to save all the soldiers who might die. That was really hard to come to terms with. You feel so dirty. By the time I was deployed to Iraq in 2005, I was 35 years old and I'd been in the army for 14 years. So when I was on the plane to Kuwait and the young soldiers around me were making all kinds of dumbass jokes about going to Iraq, I gave them a piece of my mind. Hey, I don't know what this means to you. But to me, this isn't a game. I have four kids at home who will have no understanding if I'm killed. Back when I was training at Fort Bragg, I knew things were going to get bad when I saw how my command was acting. Instead of the leadership saying we need to work together to bring these soldiers back safe and sound, too many people wanted to be chief and not enough wanted to do the work. And they were training us like we were going to fight in a jungle, not the desert. They made us practice lying in the grass and taking cover behind jungle plants. <laughs> there ain't no jungle in Iraq. And then I, I had this dream. I'm in a truck and it gets hit. The vehicle blows up. And all I see is a big ball of fire above me. My sight goes black for a minute and when it comes back I'm I'm descending from the clouds to my mom's house. My mom is there and she's going berserk because the news has gone to her that I got killed. And that's what hurt me the most. The next morning, they ordered me out to the firing range to practice shooting with live rounds, but I couldn't shake that dream. I get my weapon, and when I look up, the first sergeant and the commander are there, and I'm thinking, these morons are going to get me killed. And all of a sudden, this anger just comes over me, and I can see myself shooting both those morons dead. 
Sergeant, I can't go to the range today. Somebody needs to take this weapon off of me, please. No, sir. And I throw my weapon at my Kevlar on the ground, and I walk off. And then I call my uncle, who's a bishop, and I tell him about my dream. He says it's a warning about my leaders being so weak. So I decide I've got to speak to them. So I go to the first sergeant. We've been here now for about four or five weeks, sir. And for some reason, the senior enlisted still have not gotten it together. Now, none of these soldiers are going to tell you this to your face, but I will. We don't believe that you are able to lead a horse to water. Well, he didn't like that. <laughs> he slapped me with an Article 15 for attempting to destroy government property. That was for throwing my M16 and my helmet on the ground. And then he tried to send me for a mental eval. Sir, I've been in the Army 14 years, sir, and I have never been sent for a mental eval. Just talk to me. Sir, when there's a problem, I, I know when I get tense, my, my brows kind of frown up. <laughs> it really doesn't mean anything. I'm not as fierce as I look. So, well, I thought that was the end of that. Two weeks later, we were deployed. When we flew into Kuwait, there was nothing to do for six weeks. I had my 20th birthday there, but otherwise we just sat around and played cards. And then finally, in June 03, we convoyed to Baghdad to Camp Mustang in the Green Zone. Our mission was to reinstall the police force, guard it from the looters, fix it up, weed out the good police from the bad. Some were taking bribes, raping, beating the prisoners. We weren't allowed them to do that anymore. Some were part of the insurgency. Later, we moved to this different base where we were sleeping in tents with sandbags around them. We didn't have any protection from mortar there. This tent just down the road from us got hit. It was shredded. My friend Sandra had just left the latrine. When it got mortared, she turned around. It was gone. My first five months, the routine was the same every day. You get up. Load the trucks with equipment, go through inspections, meet with the squad about where we're going to go. Then I'd have breakfast and climb into a Humvee with the two guys who made up my team, and we'd convoy through Baghdad to a police station. Twelve hours later, the next squad comes, relieves you, you go home, put everything away, sleep, and do it all over again the next day. Now, being the lowest-ranking soldier in my team, I was the gunner. That meant that when we were driving, I was sticking out of the rooftop of the Humvee with my 50 cal machine gun in this little gun turret. Now, in the turret, you're exposed from name tag up. <laughs> we didn't have any shields. Luckily, in the beginning, we mostly got waves and good feedback. We had like 20 or 40 little kids running after us, dancing for us. And some of the women did run away. But later, people got hostile. People stare at you. Give you dirty looks, give you the finger. Some tell you to go home, throw a rock at you. And guys expose themselves because you're female. Now, as a soldier, the hostility doesn't bother me. But as a woman, it bothers me a lot. I hate it when guys do that, Iraqi or not. I think it's sick and disgusting. And some of our own soldiers were a problem, too. They make flirty or sexual comments, stare at you. That was the thing that I couldn't stand. If you go into the chow hall, there's a bunch of guys that just stop eating and stare at you. <laughs> Every time you bend over, somebody's going to say something. It just got to the point with me where I, I was afraid of walking past certain people because I didn't want to hear their comments. It just really wears you down. I said I loved my job, and I did. But right from my time at boot camp up until I got out, I was harassed all the time. People used to call me Air Force Barbie. I couldn't go anywhere without being watched by a million eyes. I had a senior non-commissioned officer constantly quiz me about my sex life, show up at my barracks at odd hours of the night, and ask me personal questions that no supervisor should ever have the right to ask. 
I had a colonel sexually harass me in ways I'm too embarrassed to explain. These are the people who had complete control over my life when I worked, when I ate, when I slept, when I could talk or not talk, rest or not rest. These are the people who I was supposed to obey no matter what. One time, my sergeant came and sat with me in the chow hall and said, I feel like I'm going to fishbowl the way all these men's eyes are boring into your back. That's what my life is like, I said. Well, finally I went to my leadership and explained the situation. I was told to write an MFR, a memo for record, every time that officer said or did anything that made me feel uncomfortable. Well, I did that for months until I had a binder just full of those memos. I took it straight to senior leadership. Did that officer get punched? No. He went on to make E9, which is the highest enlisted rank in the armed forces. Why am I complaining? It was only words and gestures, right? But it should never have happened. I was a hard worker who loved her service and country. This is not what I deserve. But like so many other females in the military, I put up with it for the good of my family, my beliefs, and my country. Well, after my first deployment, I decided the constant harassment was all just a part of being a female in the military. And I made the decision not to tell anyone anymore about my problems. Excuse my language. But I decided to be a bitch. Bitch! bitch. When I first got to Iraq in November 2005, I was still hoping to do God's work among my fellow soldiers. I was there for a year, and in the beginning I was attached to a company out of Alaska. My platoon had 60 men and one lone female, me. I was also the youngest, still 17. Because I was the only female there, men would forget in front of me all the time and say these terrible derogatory things about women. I'd have to hear these things every day. I'd have to say, hey! And then they'd look at me all surprised and say, oh, we don't mean you. One of the guys I thought was my friend tried to rape me. Two of my sergeants wouldn't stop making passes at me. Everybody's supposed to have a battle buddy in the army. Females are supposed to have one to go to the latrines with or the showers. That's so they don't get raped by the men on their own side. But because I was the only female there, I didn't have a battle buddy. My battle buddy was my gun and my knife. When we drove up into Iraq on a convoy in April, we saw how the people were living. It was so sad. We saw kids on the sides of roads using hand signals to beg for food and water. Kids barefoot and dirty. We saw how they live in makeshift mud houses held together with pieces of clothing or plastic. It, it makes us realize how blessed we are. Seeing those kids, though, made me miss my own kids real bad. <laughs> my youngest, now, you don't beat around the bush. So on Mother's Day, he sent me an email that said, Mommy, love you. Happy Mother's Day. Wish you were here. Hope you don't get killed in Iraq. OK, bye. <laughs> we were based at Camp Adder in the south, but it wasn't long before they sent me on a convoy to Camp Anaconda, which is 50 miles north of Baghdad. <laughs> Anaconda got mortared so much, the soldiers called it Mortaritaville. Our trucks had no armor, nothing. And we weren't even authorized to be out on that road, but they sent us on out anyway. And at night, too. <laughs> it was a suicide mission. I'm driving the middle gun truck when an IED goes off right under the truck in front of me. It was so loud, it scared the living shit out of me. My heart was pumping so fast, I was going to jump right out of my chest. But I showed none of what I was feeling to my soldiers. Two days later, the commanders ordered us out into formation. Well, I expected some kind of apology, but they were blabbering on about nothing. Setting up the internet. How we're violating dress codes by wearing the wrong t-shirt for PT. Dude, I've been fired at. I don't want to hear about no goddamn t-shirt. Then they said, anybody got anything to say? Nobody said anything. These soldiers were 
young and trained not to question their seniors. So I raised my hand. First Sergeant, did y'all forget about the incident two days ago? Do you realize that none of your soldiers have any confidence in the leadership now? Don't you give a damn about us? The first sergeant gives me this look like he wants to kill me, but he don't say nothing. See, when you have a female with that type of attitude in the military, it does not go over well with a lot of men. I was deployed to Iraq in 2004 when I was 42 years old and a staff sergeant with 19 years of service under my belt. I was so proud of what I'd done in the military that when my two sons grew up, I encouraged them to join too. One's in the Army, the other's the Marine. And by the time I got sent to Iraq, they gave me seven grandchildren. I was based at Camp Cedar II, a convoy pit stop about 185 miles southeast of Baghdad. I was put to work with a lieutenant in charge of organizing the movement and repairs of all the vehicles. They were so messed up, they didn't know how many soldiers they had. You could be missing for a week, and nobody would know. So I thought, okay, they don't know what they're doing any better than I do. And I started organizing the whole thing myself. But we were under command of this female major, a white woman who hated anyone who wasn't white and male. She replaced every soldier of color with a white soldier, and she made the soldiers of color train the white people who would take over their jobs. She destroyed the careers of many soldiers of color doing that. But if you said anything, you'd be punished. One of the first things she did when we got to Iraq was she made me and the other female non-commissioned officers move into the same tents as the privates. We literally had that much space between our bunks. Now, you do not move a higher ranking soldier in with a lower ranking. It makes you lose your power base because it's their territory. The major knew this. That's why she did it. Soon, the privates are refusing to obey our orders. This one girl, Benson, she had a canopy over her bed with pink blankets, and I thought, what the fuck? But when I tell her to move her bed over a foot to make room for me, she goes into this itty bitty little voice like a baby. I don't care what you say, I'm not moving, Sergeant Flores. <laughs> <laughs> but I got worried about what my young soldiers were going through out there on the roads in Iraq. One was this young female sergeant who trained as a driver, but they made her into a gunner because there was a shortage of military police to do the job. That's how a lot of women end up in combat in this war. Well, she and her team were out on the road one day, and they were attacked with mortars and grenades. So the sergeant fires back with her machine gun, and she kills a bunch of civilians. When she gets back, she's all excited and shouting about what happened. Adrenaline's up. Tomorrow's gonna be a different story. Then I realized the combat stress team hasn't turned up. Now they're supposed to come help soldiers like this who've been in battle. But nobody bothered to come. Go to bed. It'll be fine. But I know it won't. Sure enough, the next morning, this soldier and her team were a mess. One's lying in her bunk in a fetal position, and the others are sobbing because, well, they killed all these innocent people. And Benson, the girl with the pink blankets, she was driving a large truck in a convoy. Now, over there you drive on the opposite side of the road a lot to avoid IEDs, and you drive fast. So this car was coming towards them, but nobody had time to get out of the way. So the car ends up driving right underneath the truck. Killed four children and both the parents. There was blood and body parts all over the place. So when she gets back to camp, she's in shock. 
I guess she thought I was still mad at her because she just stood there and didn't say anything. So I hugged her. She started crying. She was only 20 years old. They should have debriefed these girls. They should have had a combat stress person there, but they didn't. Nobody was taking care of these kids, so you can imagine the condition they were in when they got back home. And I know it's not getting any better. In October 03, I was sent up to Bakuba, just northeast of Baghdad. We stayed in camp with War Force. One night, we were in the rec building. I was doing my email when the whole building shook. There was this high-pitched squealing sound and a flash, and it went black. Everybody stared at each other a second, then dropped to the ground. 20 seconds later, another bomb came in. I grabbed somebody's shirt. Take me to the bunker. We got outside. There was no bunker. Another mortar dropped 50 meters away. Shrapnel was flying over our heads. This girl was lying on the ground screaming. My bow is coming out of my eye. My bow is coming out of my eye. Someone inside the building was calling. Medic! Medic! I ran back inside. I saw four bodies on the ground. Two Iraqi workers and two American soldiers. I started working on them. It was black in there, and all I had was this tiny blue flashlight to see. Blood was all over the place. This female was lying on the ground, covered in it, and this guy called Sergeant Hill was helping her. I said, is this blood all hers? Is an artery hit? He said, no, I think some of it's mine. I got hit too, but she's worse. I found someone else to help her, and then I lifted his arm, and there was all this blood. He was much worse than her, but he didn't realize because he was in shock. We packed all the wounded into the Humvee. I was holding back this guy's blood with my hand. The, another mortar dropped. We had no flat jackets, no Kevlar's, nothing. So we threw our bodies on top of the patients. The mortar stopped long enough for us to drive the wounded to the hospital. As Soon as I got there, I saw a nurse and yelled, this is Sergeant Hill, he's 32, he's O positive, he needs blood now. How do you know? Because I'm covered in blood and none of it's mine. The only thing that helped me survive my time in Iraq was my boyfriend, Stephen. I could not have got through it without him. We met the night that I arrived at Fort Dix, New Jersey for my AIT. We started talking immediately. He said, give me your number. And then later he texts me saying, what's good? We started going out right away. Stephen's black, but he looks kind of Dominican. Real cute. Six foot, big, muscular guy from New York. Now, you're not allowed to fraternize in the army, which means have a relationship, but everybody did. And because he was a sergeant and I was a specialist, nobody could know about us. Everybody knew. Then, I got pregnant by him. So I couldn't deploy when he did and the rest of my team did. I had to stay behind at Fort Dix with strangers. Then, after three months, I had a miscarriage. It made me feel really empty and sad. I really loved Stephen. I really wanted to have his baby. They gave me one month to recover, and then they said, you're going to Iraq, which made me really mad, because one month is not enough time to get over losing a baby. But in February 05, they sent me to Fob Spiker. They put me in this little chew, which is uh, it's a trailer that sleeps two people, but you got to share it with three. The night I arrived, it was so tight in there, I had to squeeze my way into it. I didn't end up getting along with the girl on my right, but the girl on my left, she was a friend from before. She was so excited to see me because, you know, last she heard I was pregnant. First thing I did was I put on my favorite perfume and I went to look for Steven. Now, we hadn't seen each other for four months, and last he heard, you know, uh, I was coming, but he didn't know when. So, I knocked on his door, and his roommate answered and said that he didn't know where he was. And then I remembered the time difference. When it was midnight for him, it was 3 o'clock for me, and that's when we would talk online. So I thought, I know where he is. So, I ran over to the recreational building, and sure enough, 
There he was, sitting at a corner computer with his back to me. Now, I didn't go up to him right away. Instead, I sat at the computer and I logged online. Sure enough, there he was. So I wrote, I'm in Kuwait, but it's really cool that I'm on your time zone. And then he wrote, it's weird. I can smell you. <laughs> I must really miss you because I can smell your perfume. So then I, I wrote, turn around. And he turned around. He just started laughing. In each police station that we fixed up in Baghdad, um, we'd go through the day searching people coming into the station and switching guard positions. I searched mostly women. Guys are not allowed to do that in Iraq. And you're there like 12 hours every day, standing or sitting. It is hot. You can't move. And you have to watch everybody all the time. But you get used to it. The part that I couldn't stand was the people I was working with. My squad leader was a pervert. He was old, like 35 or 40. <laughs> he used to point out these little Iraqi girls and say disgusting sexual stuff about them all the time. These girls are like 12 or 13 years old. But the worst was my team leader. He uh, made passes at me at first. He stopped. But then he tried to have revenge by controlling everything I did. I had to eat with him. He wouldn't let me eat with my friends. I had to clean my weapon with him. He wouldn't let me talk to anybody. So I'd stay up in my Humvee turret all day long just to get away from him. Alone. Every day. People would know because they'd come up to me and say, Man, your life sucks! <laughs> When I asked to get switched, they wouldn't do it. And that really made me hate my time there. It got so that I didn't trust anybody in my company anymore after a few months. I didn't trust anybody at all. Still don't. During my first few months in Iraq, my sergeant assaulted and harassed me so often I couldn't take it anymore. So I decided to report him, but when I turned him in... The one common factor in all these problems is you. Don't see this as a punishment, but we're going to have you transferred. Then that same sergeant got promoted right away. I didn't get my promotion for six months. They transferred me from Mosul to Rawa. Rawa was nothing but a tent camp on the Syrian border covered in sand. The camp had Marines, Navy, Air Force, and Army. There were over 1,500 men in the camp and less than 18 women, so it wasn't any better than the first platoon I was in. I was fresh meat to the hungry men there. I was less scared of the mortar rounds that came in every day than I was <coughs> of the men who shared my food. I would never drink late in the day, even though it was so hot. Because the Porta Johns was so far away, it was dangerous. So I'd go for 16 hours in 140 degree heat and not drink. I just ate Skittles to keep my mouth from being too dry. I collapsed from dehydration so often I have IV track lines from all the times they had to rehydrate me. They made me cook because I was female, though I wanted to do other jobs too. So I was cooking 1,500 meals three times a day. I worked from four in the morning till nine at night the next day. I was exhausted all the time. One day, somebody wrote my name on a porta john saying I'd had sex with a lot of people, only they put it in much worse words than that. But when I wasn't working, I went to chapel and then I went to bed. That was all I did. Work, chapel, bed. Work, chapel, bed. It was so untrue, but I couldn't prove it. I couldn't defend myself. Nobody there wanted to believe me. Nobody was on my side. I always tried to stay cheerful, be nice to everyone. Back in boot camp, I was known as Sunshine. But within a few months, I went from cheerful and smiling to bursting into tears all the time. 
I couldn't even smile anymore. I called Mama, crying, and told her what they were doing to me. If you were treading the path of righteousness, none of this would be happening. When I was working at the entrance to Spiker, uh, we saw convoys being hit all the time. Highway 1 ran right past our base. We called it the Highway of Death because so many people got killed there by IEDs and mortars. One night, this convoy got hit. It was, it was like this huge flash in the night, and then they, they drove to us with their wounded. This civilian, he uh, got out of his car and started throwing up because his brother, who was sat next to him, had been shot in the throat. I was out, out in the tank on the road just looking at him. Oh, we, we radioed for an ambulance, but they had to go through all these clearance and shit, so by the time it arrived, it was too late. The guy who'd been shot was already dead. No, I never really thought about dying that much when I was in Iraq. I figure everything happens for a reason, and we're going to die someday, so I was never really afraid of dying. What I was afraid of, though, was um, losing a limb, or scarring my face, or, or tripping. Because walking is really hard, you know, it's hot, and you've got all this heavy equipment, which weighs nearly half your weight if you're small, like me. And I was worried about our equipment, too. We had these um, flak jackets from Vietnam, and everybody said, oh, they're no good against AK-47s, which is what the Iraqis are shooting. Our radios were old and broken, and our ambulances rattled and shook. I, I cannot imagine traveling in one of those when you're wounded. But I, I didn't mind working the checkpoint. I mean, I, I got to work with Steven that way because he was the team leader. And this, the sunrises and sunsets were beautiful. And I, I got along with the guys on my team most of the time. A couple of things they did bothered me. Stephen went home for two weeks on R&R. &R. And when he was gone, they hit on me all the time. And then when he got back, they made up all these stories about me in the hope that we would break up and they would get a chance with me. Oh, and if we were attacked, they would make me stay at the back of the tank, and they'd be like, oh, it's because you're like a little sister. We don't want anything to happen to you. And I would say, no! Don't look at me like I'm your little sister. I am a soldier, not a gender. I'm a soldier just like you. Well, then they took it to the next level. Uh, we had to guard out on the road. Nobody wants to guard out on the road. The soldier that's out on the road is known as the sacrifice soldier because you're the first to be hit if anything happens. For a while, they put me out there every night. They didn't want to hear me say, I'm a soldier. I'm a soldier, just like you and you and you. My second deployment was to Afghanistan in 2006 with the Army 10th Mountain Division. Now by this time I'm a sergeant with years of sexual harassment under my belt. So I decided this time it was going to be different. This time I decided to put up a wall. Now my wall became thicker and thicker. <clears throat> you know, normally I'm a very bubbly person, but all that disappeared behind the wall and to this day, I don't know if I've ever regained that part of myself. But you have to put up a front and act like one of the boys, even if it means losing who you are. You become very cold, and you don't show your emotions. And you don't let anyone in, because if you do, they will walk all over you. Still, the harassment was worse than it had ever been. A few months into my deployment, I was directed to pull knock of duty. Now, I smoked like a chimney when I was in Afghanistan, and this night was no exception. So after a few hours, I put my weapon and my radio in the guard shack and walked 20 feet to the closest smoke deck. You don't ever leave your weapon unattended in the combat zone. I had a momentary lapse. 
thought I would be okay 20 feet from my weapon. I was wrong. I'd just taken a few drags of my cigarette when somebody grabbed me in a chokehold and dragged me behind some power generators. All I could see was a man much larger than me in a U.S. Armed Forces uniform. I struggled with all my strength to get free while he dragged me to this spot. I tried my hardest to fight him off and I got in a few kicks, but it wasn't enough. He finished his deep and left. Well, I waited until my ship was over and then did what every law and order show says to. Don't take a shower, go straight to the authorities. I thought they would listen to me. I was wrong. They told me if I filed a claim that I'd been raped, I'd also be charged with dereliction of duty for leaving my weapon unattended in a combat zone. That could get me court-martialed. Could end my career. So I shut up. Shut up! After I got to Iraq, they made me convoy commander. Now, some of those convoys were 25 trucks long, and I was in charge of making sure that every one of those soldiers and drivers did the mission and got back in one piece. One time, I'm in the lead gun truck going through a crowded street with this young guy up in the gunner chute. Now, he hasn't been out on the road before. He'd been in the office doing paperwork for so long, he was getting called Professor Stapler. Now, we got traffic coming at us and civilians all over the place. And then this car comes toward us too close for comfort. But being that it's my gunner's first time, he doesn't know what to do. So I tell him, fire a warning shot. He doesn't shoot. So I tap him. Hey man, don't be afraid to fucking shoot that weapon, okay? You do know how to shoot, right? The vehicle is getting closer and closer, but the moron still doesn't shoot, so I hit him hard. Hey man, I tell you to fucking fire, you fucking fire! You don't never let a vehicle get that close to my fucking car, boy! He knows I'm not playing now. So he fires at the car. The hood peels right up, the whole car goes whop, 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 rolls over on its side and then tumbles over this bank. My gunner panics, he's, he's only 19. He grabs his head and he yells, Oh my God, I think I killed somebody! <clears throat> Look, it's not your fault. I don't think you shot nobody, but we've still got a lot of shit coming at us, you hear me? So I need you to focus right now and pay attention. But his face is red and he is yelling, Oh my God! But when we get back after that, he has got a story to tell the guys. And it makes him feel like he has matured from a boy to a man. See. A lot of young soldiers feel that way. Women, too. They think, I'm not some wimpy female because of the job I did in Iraq. The longer we were in Baghdad, the worse it got. It got so that you knew something was going to happen every day, you just didn't know what. One day we were driving to this police station in Najif when suddenly this IED blew up right next to my Humvee truck. And I must have passed out because when I woke up, I was by myself in the truck and uh, my ears were ringing and my whole body hurt. <laughs> they gave me first aid, some IV and field dressing. I had shrapnel. That's little bits of metal in my arm and in my face. And my eardrums were ruptured. I uh, went to the hospital and they cleaned me up. They gave me painkillers, but I couldn't work for a month because I was deaf. I uh, just hung out on base, watched a lot of movies, and I slept. My body hurt so bad. But it didn't faze me to be wounded like that. I was like, okay, I'm alive. In fact, I was kind of pissed that I didn't get her worse. <laughs> I really hated it out there. And the shrapnel's still in there. They only take it out if it's really big. 
They took it out of my face. You can see the scars, but it's not hideous. My uh, hearing's not as good as it used to be. My friend, Michelle Whitmer, she was in our platoon. She got hit, too, in an ambush. Um, shot in the armpit. It hit an artery. She was 20 years old. She died instantly. My tour in Iraq was a real high opener for me. Because my biggest enemy out there was my own company. Officers would brief us by saying, it's Indian country out there, go get them. I found that very shocking. If this was Indian country, perhaps I'm on the wrong side. But when I was over there, a lot of young people would come and ask me for help, especially soldiers of color. And I would stand up for them against their command. After all, I was old enough to be their mom. But that got me into lots of trouble with my command. I was banned from my unit. I wasn't allowed to talk to anyone. And then they sent me to another base. I can't stand it. That's where they send soldiers to punish them. Because Scania's on a major highway and it gets mortared all the time. The whole time I was at Scania, I hardly ever wrote home, even to my sons. I didn't even think about home. It's because you become hollow, like a robot. You get up, you do your job, you hear people complain, you talk about this, you talk about that, but you don't look inside. My sister sent me a medicine box with my prayer stuff in it. So I'd sit at night, smoke a cigarette, offer my prayers, and I'd watch the moon. That brought me some peace. That and, and the songs I would hear the Iraqi men singing in the morning at Camp Scania, the prayer songs, the songs would echo and Oh my God, it was so beautiful, like angels. I'd wake up peaceful because of those songs. I think they saved me from myself because there were times I thought I was going insane. What the fuck am I doing here? Why am I not just getting on a plane and going home? What am I doing on this base? It's a concentration camp. That's when I started talking to the Iraqis who worked on the base. The young ones would come up to me and say, you're Indian from India? And I would say, no. And then finally, one of them comes back after seeing the movie Dancing with Wolves, and he goes, you're Red Indian. And I said, yes, I'm a red Indian. And he goes, Native American? And I'm like, yes. So I was invited to have a meal with them at the market they had just outside the base. They cooked the same kind of rice my people cook. The same kind of bread and chicken. I tell them, we make this kind of bread. Tell me about your people and your religion. I want to know about your women. I want to know what you think about this war. I found out so many of their traditions are the same with mine. The significance of the moon, tobacco ceremonies, the way we use sage, and their clan systems, how people marry in and out of clans. And I thought, what the hell am I doing here? Why am I doing this to these people? 
I start to see how we were changing their clan system, their council system. It's been there for thousands of years. I start to see how imposing democracy means it's not democracy anymore. And I start to think this war is a genocide. If it wasn't, we'd have things in place to help the women, to help the children, to help the civilians. But we don't care about them. We'd rather they die. Die!
that I gotta be really drunk to dance. I started getting depressed. 
that's never happened to me before. I've always been able to deal with things, but I think it was, you know, being in the army and Iraq and losing the baby and Grammy, it just, it just all got too much. And it, it made me really angry, the way that I was being treated as a female veteran, because we don't get the same respect as men. We have to really fight for it. I've actually stopped telling people about seeing death, being shot at, because I know that nobody believes me. Everyone assumes that I just did office work. I moved east um, to be with Stephen and to go to school and to get away from my family. Um, and then I got pregnant by him again. Now, he is a really sweet guy, but he's different from before. He's from the hood. He has whoever he had before he had me. I don't know if he has them now. So it looks like I'm raising this baby by myself. Whatever. I've never spoken to my family about my time in Iraq. They've asked me, but I always say, oh, um, it was hot. I don't want to tell them anything. Because I, I don't want to feel sorry for myself. And the people close to you, they just, they wouldn't understand anyhow. You can't hate them for not understanding. But a lot of the time, you do. If you ask the majority of soldiers, do you know what our purpose is in Iraq? They couldn't tell you. Some might give you some political bull bullshit to justify it, or say because we wear the uniform we're supposed to not speak bad about it, but most soldiers would say that they don't see the point. If you think about this area here <coughs> as the place the military built for us soldiers, you got showers and running water and toilet you can flush, you got trailers, beds, mattresses, air conditioners, washers and dryers, you know, some big generators running all night. You got Taco Bells, Subways, PX's good food, lobster, shrimp, steak. And we're not paying the Iraqis any property taxes or anything at all for all our luxuries. But over here, on the outskirts, you got Iraqi families living in huts. No electricity, no running water, who are starving. And you tell us when we go outside these gates and there's a kid on the side of the road asking for water, we're not supposed to give it to them? We've got warehouses full of water. But I can't give <coughs> one bottle to this kid out here who don't have any because we bomb the shit out of their water supply and everything else too. The U.S. government isn't going to stand for anyone coming in and telling us how to run things like that. But we think it's fine to go over there and westernize them. These people have been living this way for centuries. Now, I may not agree with their way, but that's their country. And who's to say that our way is the right way? You know what we are? We're just bullies. Bullies. That's what we are. When I came home from Iraq, I uh, kept everything to myself. I thought I was going to be okay. I <coughs> went straight back to school. I worked hard. But by a year later, oh, I was tense all the time. I was snippy to my friends, hostile. Stopped hanging out. I did homework every night for hours. And I wasn't sleeping well either. I didn't get any help, though. I thought my problem was hormones or something. Girl things. Maybe that's because those post-traumatic stress videos they show you never represent women. I don't act like a guy who has PTSD. I don't get into a car and drive 80 miles an hour and push things! <laughs> so, well, I I didn't even recognize that there was anything wrong until my boyfriend said, you need to get some help. 
Oh, I did. Some people ask me what the best part of being in the Army was for me. Is it my drive to succeed now or all the friendships that I made? I can't think of a best part. Every day there was a bad day. By the time I got home in April 2004, after 11 months in Iraq, I was really a mess. I couldn't sleep for more than 50 minutes at a time, and I'd be awake for two hours in between. I got angry easily, agitated. I had nightmares about the mortar attacks. <coughs> Flashbacks. On New Year's Eve, they had fireworks in our town square, and as soon as I heard the booms, I fell to my knees. Every time I opened my eyes, the faces in front of me would fade away, and I'd be brought to that night we were attacked. I was crying hysterically. My friends didn't know what to do. And I had nothing to talk about. All my friends' conversations were about movies I hadn't seen or a fashion I didn't know about. Anything I talked about turned morbid very quick. Little kids in Iraq, dead, <laughs> mortar attack. <laughs> that everyone would get quiet and no one would know what to say. I remember this girl talking about how she wanted some designer purse, and I said, yeah, I know what you mean. One time in Iraq, these kids wanted some food, and I felt really bad because we didn't have enough to give them. I hate it when you can't get what you want. Everyone just sat there. They felt like assholes. I felt like an asshole. I was so out of place after I got home, I couldn't feel comfortable in my skin, and I couldn't talk about it to anyone. I didn't know other soldiers were going through the same thing, so I thought I was crazy. My back and head were injured, too. I'm 80% disabled now because my back's so messed up from banging around in the Humvee, no shock absorbers, hitting my head on the ceiling, compressing my spine. And I couldn't stop worrying about that guy in the mortar attack, Sergeant Hill, and whether he'd lost his arm, and could I have done something more? I tried to get a medical discharge from the Army to pay for my benefits, but they made it so difficult, I gave up. I couldn't get the tuition they promised me for a long time either. For a long time, I couldn't even get to a clinic for my medication or therapy because all the VA clinics were so far away. I work with veterans now, so I know a lot of soldiers go through this, which helps. It's important for vets to reach out to each other so you don't feel alone and crazy like I did. Um, I still think a lot about why we went to war. Was Saddam a bad person who needed to be removed from power? Yes. Was he the reason for us going in there? Not really. And it's not the guys sitting in their air-conditioned offices at the Pentagon who are feeling the aftermath of it. It's the mother and father who are getting their child sent home in a box. The innocent people of Iraq who've been killed and raped and had their villages turned upside down. I really do love some of those people of Iraq. I don't know how to help them. Some of those kids were so beautiful. They only wanted attention and food. Still, I knew if I had to kill a kid to save my buddies, I would. How could anybody love anyone who has such horrible thoughts? When I came home from Afghanistan, I, I didn't talk to anyone about the rape. I felt it was all my own fault. It took me six months to even tell my mother why I had to leave the Air Force. <clears throat> why I could never go back. The military has a way of making females believe they brought this upon themselves. Yes, I made some bad decisions, but the guilt lies with the predator, not me. There's an unwritten code of silence when it comes to sexual assault in the military. But if this happened to me and nobody knew about it, I just know it's happening to other females as well. It makes me so mad when I think about the fact that I let them get to me and left the military. I was so proud of being third generation. I had dreams of becoming a high-ranking officer one day, like my father and my grandfather. Now, those dreams will never come true. Well, 
By the time I came home, I felt like I had messed everything up. I'd let my mom and dad down. I'd let everyone down. I hated myself. September 30th, 2006. That was the day it was all going to end. No more shame would be brought to my family. It would be over. Take the tip of a blade to the middle of your forearm. Touch the top of the main vein. Press the honed steel through your skin. Drag it down so there's no room for mistakes. One shot, one kill. That's what they teach in the army. See the thick blood running bright red? For a moment it seemed that that gash would bring relief. I was ready to cut the other arm when my phone rang. It was Mama. She'd felt God pushing her to call. She wanted to tell me how proud of me she was. Before I went to Iraq, I used to hold healing ceremonies for women. But when I got back home, I couldn't deal with those women anymore. To me, everything they talked about was petty, and I didn't want to hear it. I lost connection with my mother, brothers, my sons boyfriend, everybody. I came back so angry, and I didn't know why. Nobody could stand me. I couldn't stand myself. <clears throat> it's really hard to admit you have PTSD. It feels <clears throat> weak, because the military teaches you to suck it up and drive on. After I'd been home for a while, my former husband, George, died. He'd raped me and beaten me up, but I went to his funeral anyway. Maybe just to make sure he was dead. <laughs> but there was another part of me that cried. Not because he was my husband, but because he was a Vietnam vet who got lost. He didn't come back from war the same. He always talked about raping girls in Vietnam. So what he did to me wasn't any different from what he was used to. So whose fault is it? I don't know. But I don't think he was born that kind of person. I think the military made him like that and I forgave him. After all, I have two sons from him. After I'd been home from Iraq for about half a year, I wouldn't even dress up, wouldn't wear makeup, didn't care. Couldn't concentrate, couldn't sleep, couldn't work. And I became paranoid thinking people were following me and breaking into my house. And I was afraid to take sleeping pills because that would make me vulnerable if somebody attacked me. And I was broke. I joined the army to get off welfare. Here I was, 
after 22 years in the military on welfare again. Not the only soldier going through this. My friend who had served with in Iraq came home a year ago. They found her dead in her home. She'd been dead for two days. Had PTSD and depression so bad and she couldn't tell anybody because there was nobody to tell, so she killed herself. The war isn't over when you come home. One thing I really can't stand is for people to come and say, Thank, thank you for your service. service. I hate that. Are you thanking me for participating in a genocide? Is that what you want? Because I am not protecting anybody's country. I am taking somebody's. Now, even though I never pulled the trigger, I feel that I participated in a genocide. I feel very responsible, and that's a hard thing to live with. <clears throat> Everything we've done in Iraq is a lie, and I feel very ashamed that I didn't see it sooner and stand up against it. I was a drill sergeant. My job was to teach other people's children how to kiss. People ask me how could I as a spiritual person teach people to kill? How, as a mother, could I send my own sons to war? I asked myself that. I bought into the whole thing. I thought it was the honorable thing to do. Project is one of the media, social media successes of 2012. Mm -hmm. So, welcome, Laura, if you'd like to join me on stage. Thank you very much. <laughs> the way we're going to do it is I'm going to ask Laura a couple of questions about the Everyday Sexism Project, and then I will open it up to all of you um, in the audience. And maybe we might get some Twitter um, comments or whatever. So Laura, um, one of the first questions that everybody would like to know is what is the Everyday Sexism Project and why did you find, you know, how did you come about starting it? Um, well, the project's really simple. It started out as a website. Um, I started it in 2012 um, after a, about a week and a half during which, by sheer coincidence, I just had a bunch of experiences that happened to all four very close together. So I was walking home one night and a guy started shouting at me out of his car window and the traffic was at a crawl so the guy in the next car heard and thought it would be funny to try and shout something worse and they kind of started escalating and I put my head down, walked home and didn't think anything more of it. And then a few nights later I was on my way home quite late at night on the bus on the phone to my mum and the guy next to me started groping his way up my leg and into my crotch. 
So I stood up and moved away from him, and because I was on the phone to my mum, I said what was happening out loud. I said, I'm on the bus, this guy just groped me. And everybody on the bus heard, and everybody looked out the window. No one stepped in to help, no one said anything, and there was a real sense of kind of shame and embarrassment that I felt directed at me. You know, why are you bringing this up? Just deal with it. And then a few nights later, I was walking down the street. Um, actually, it was daytime, and um, there was a truck being unloaded of some scaffolding. And as I walked past, one guy turned to the other within a metre of me and just said, look at the tits on that. Not even her, just that. And I was really, really close to them. And again, the thing that really struck me was just how normal it was. There was no sense that I might say anything back, that I wouldn't just accept it, that it was kind of embarrassing. And the thing that really hit me after these incidents was it made me realise if they hadn't all happened in the same week, I probably wouldn't have thought twice about any one of them because it was normal and I was used to it. And it just made me start thinking, why is it normal? Why am I so used to this? And also, can it be just me? Because I think we often think, I must have done something wrong. I must just be unlucky. I'm overreacting. So yeah. I started talking to other women and girls. And I was just going to say, them. in the play, a lot of the women felt feel <clears throat> that they're alone. That's one of the one of the themes running through. They think they're the only ones, that they're to blame. And it's quite interesting to hear the parallel in the civilian world, you know, the same yeah. sort of things that you felt. Yeah, and I think also similar things about feeling like if you speak out, yes. either fearing that you won't be believed or thinking that even if you are, it won't be taken seriously. And that's a theme that comes up a lot in the project entries. So when I started talking to other women and girls, I was really shocked by the number of stories they had. It was every woman I spoke to, and it was on my way to meet you just now, this happens. I spoke to women in the workplace who said that the guys in their office would routinely go to strip clubs at lunchtime and entertain clients there so they would miss out on certain deals. I spoke to a woman who said that in her workplace, when new women were coming in to be interviewed for positions in the office, her male colleagues would print out their pictures and rate them out of 10 across the room. And just like me, so many of them made a point of saying, until you ask me, I've never told anyone any of these stories because it's just normal. And so I set the website up as a means of providing a platform right. for them. Because when I try to speak up, when I try to talk about sexism, say, I think this is sexism, I think this is something's yeah. going on, people said, no, there's no such thing as sexism anymore. Women are equal now. There's no problem. Mm -hmm. So the project was very simply an effort to bridge the gap between the idea that we've achieved equality and the reality of what women and girls were dealing with, often on a daily basis, mm -hmm. but that people didn't necessarily know about because it was so normal that people weren't speaking up. Well, one of the things that um, we, um, I did this play as a reading in 2013. It's an American play. It's about the American military and female soldiers. And when I did it in 2013, um, I wanted to gauge English reactions to it and see whether it was worth taking it forward. As a producer, it's also important to see whether you'd get an audience. And one of the things that happened uh, was that I had a chap from the military who came up to me afterwards, and I actually happened to know him slightly. I'd been introduced to him, and he said, Prav, I'm just going to say one thing. Um, couldn't happen in the UK military. And, um, and, it, and I had nothing to say in 2013. There was nothing out there. And unfortunately, in 2014, uh, there was an inquest uh, for this young soldier, Corporal Anne-Marie Element, who committed suicide in 2011. She, she was at Royal Military Police, and she alleged rape uh, by two of her fellow soldiers, and she went to her, uh, her commander, and they just, submit, they just dismissed it because they, they said, oh, it's not a problem. And it was, as, so that happened in 2000, and she took her own life. She got so depressed they, that she took her own life. And the family then got in touch with Liberty and wanted representation. So they reopened the inquest in 2014. And the coroner in that case said, yes, the army were culpable. And it was bullying and sexual harassment. And not only was it um, <coughs> men, but it was also women who were bullying her. So. The fact that she'd spoken out and said that she'd, that she'd been raped uh, caused a big problem. And so, um, so it, it's a universal problem in the military. So what I'm going to ask Laura is, is that what you found? Has the project widened? Yes, 
hugely. Um, so entries started coming in. It was just a tiny website, and I didn't have any way of promoting it or advertising it. So I really <laughs> thought that I would get sort of 50 or 60 testimonies right. from people, you know, in, in my immediate area, perhaps people I knew. And what actually happened was that entries just started to pour in, and it just started to snowball. And just as you said, it started to be that entries were coming in from women all over the world, from women of different backgrounds, different sexual orientations, different races and ethnicities, different gender identities. We started getting stories uh, that came in so quickly that three years later, and it's just three <coughs> years since we started the project, we've had 100,000 stories from people all over the world. And they've ranged enormously from street harassment and kind of day-to-day -day minor normalized sexism right. to huge numbers of stories from girls at school, girls of 10 or 11 when they start experiencing these things, girls at university, uh, women in the workplace experiencing enormous amounts of discrimination and also people reporting sexual abuse and rape. So it's widened very quickly into this kind of massive grassroots collection of people's experiences. Right. So that's one of the parallels between the play and everyday sexism. And it, you know, doing this play has brought up the fact that it may, may be when there, there's women in the military, that it is a universal problem. Um, what do you think, what has it revealed, apart from the fact? Has, has there been any change? How do you feel that we can go forward with this project? Um, well, the first thing that became really clear, I think, from the project entries was the connections between the more serious things that we're often allowed to talk about and allowed to consider problems, and the minor things that we're told to brush off don't make a fuss about. And it really struck me, watching the play tonight, that there was echoes of that, you know, that there are certain things where you think, if somebody speaks up about that, you'd say, oh, don't make a fuss. You can see yes. them being told not to make a fuss until it's the really, really serious stuff. But what became so clear from the project entries was that actually, if we say that some of these things are okay, if we say it's not that big a deal to comment on a woman's breast in the street, it's not that big a deal to make a sexist comment in the classroom, then we're opening the door to the idea of women as second-class citizens, and we're creating a status quo, a normalization of that idea, which I think also is at the root of some of the bigger problems. So I think the first thing that it really showed was just how important it is to be able to talk about and tackle these things, even if they seem apparently minor. Um, but in terms of where it's going next and moving yes. forward, what's been really exciting is that we have definitely seen a shift in the kind of entries that we're receiving, in that now that the project's become so well known, we're still receiving people's experiences of discrimination and harassment and sexual abuse, but we're also receiving stories from people writing in saying, this has changed things for me. I've been able to speak out about sexual violence for the first time. I've been able to report discrimination in my workplace for the first time because it's made me feel that I'm not alone. And I think what that shows is really the power of this kind of story sharing exercise to break these kind of illusions about the fact that it doesn't happen, yeah. to empower other people to think they've been brave enough to speak out and so perhaps I can too. Okay. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up the debate and um, put it out to the floor. Do you have any questions for Laura at all? Does anybody have any? Oh, is there some Twitter comments? Uh, <coughs> how would the website work for sexism in the military? Well, the answer to that is that actually we already get quite a lot okay. of entries that come from women in the military, which is really interesting. Oh, right, right. Um, and one thing that we've been able to do so far with specific aspects like that is that we've been able to take the stories that we've received <coughs> online, offline into the real world and use them to create concrete change. Oh, lovely. So, for example, we took the stories that we'd received that were just from women on public transport, on buses and tubes, which amounted to about 2,000 entries, and we took them to the British Transport Police and worked with them to actually use those stories of what people were going through to retrain their officers to better deal with sexual offences. And that campaign, we then went back to social media and were able to spread the word that we'd spoken to the police and they were taking it seriously. And um, what happened was that it raised the reporting of sexual offences on public transport by 26%. 26%? Yeah. So I hope that that's the kind of thing that we might be able to do in similar ways with specific professions, like, for example, people who work in the military, as we get more of these stories, to be able to put them together and... It's so that it's not an isolated voice. Exactly. So one of the one of the dramatic devices that I, you know, as a director, put into the play was the 
the voiceless soldier. Um, and that's a representation of, of all the women who don't feel brave enough to come and speak, uh, who don't have the voice and, and suffer in silence. And, and I thought it was really important um, to put that in because the other voices said what they wanted to at Helen Benedict, the playwright, but there were many soldiers who probably didn't have the opportunity or didn't feel brave enough or have the courage or did not perhaps even want to admit that something that terrible had happened to them and maybe the army was the only life they knew or had so um, that was one of the things I did but um, <coughs> when we were chatting what do you what do you, how do you feel about sort of you know the, the, the teenage population who are sort of quite young and and being brought up with social media from age zero now you know, do you think the pressures are much more than before? I definitely think there's something new there. I think it's very difficult to sort of compare over time for me because I haven't been working in this field for long enough. Yeah. But what I can definitely say is that there is a lot that young people are dealing with of, of ways that this particular problem manifests itself in, in new ways. So, for example, we hear a huge number of entries from young people about porn and the impact it has on them. Right. Um, a 13-year-old girl wrote in and said, My name's Nicola, I'm 13 years old, and I'm so scared to have sex I cry nearly every night because I've seen a video on a boy's mobile phone at school and I didn't realise that when you have sex, the woman has to be hurting and crying. So I think because a lot of the porn that is out there is particularly about women being hurt and women crying, you see the impact of that a lot because we don't have sex and relationships education that teaches kids in a very simple age-appropriate way about sexual consent and healthy relationships. Right. And so they assume that what they see online is what sex has to be like. And I think that's very scary for boys as well. We had another story that came from a girl who was 17 and she'd had sex with her boyfriend for the first time. And halfway through, he started trying to choke her. And she pushed him away and he broke down in tears and uh, relieved and said, is that not what you were expecting? <laughs> and this is really something that comes up a lot. These aren't isolated incidents. I was in a school a few weeks ago where they'd had a rape case involving a 14-year-old boy. And one of the teachers had said to him, why didn't you stop when she was crying? And he'd looked straight back at her and said, because it's normal for girls to cry during sex. So I think there's certainly a real problem there that we are going to have to start facing sooner or later right. about the online world, the way that women are portrayed, and the fact that we're not taking the steps that we need to to offset that with support and guidance for young people in schools about things like consent and healthy relationships. Does anybody have a question in the audience here at all? Would you like to ask Laura anything? Yeah, I was wondering, just on the school topic, like, yeah. I, do you think that schools have a role to play in this kind of thing, and how do you think your school project could fit in with that? Um, I definitely think schools have a role to play and I realise that schools are already very kind of overburdened but I think that if they can be supported in putting this stuff into place it's just so important because it's one of the only ways we can guarantee that everybody gets that teaching and I think that's completely crucial. I think there are different ways it can manifest itself so the way that the project does that and works in that sense at the moment is partly that we use the stories we get from young people to go into schools and to deliver workshops and talks around healthy relationships and online porn and sexual consent using those stories as a jumping off point but we also have a play which is very similar in, in style to this one, a verbatim style play which has been created by a theatre company who are going to use that and it directly takes the words from the project entries and they go into schools touring around the country to use it as a jumping off point for just opening up these issues because so many of the schools we go into afterwards girls will come out and say things that have happened and it just opens the door for them to feel able to talk about it and for boys as well. We hear from boys who are being sort of bullied in school for wanting to take art or drama GCSE because it's considered too girly, that kind of thing. And so I think there are lots of ways that you can open up these conversations and I hope the project has a role to play. Anybody else? Yeah. Um, do you now confront um, that type of um, harassment that you were talking about um, at the beginning when, when you first started the project? And if so, what sort of thing do you say? 
Yes, I do. If I feel safe, I do. I think it's so important to say that it's never about saying that there's any one right or wrong response. We should be stopping it from happening in the first place, not mandating any kind of response. And I would never want someone to feel that if they didn't respond, it was then somehow their fault. Um, but there have been really great responses that we've had people writing in that have been really successful. And one of them is reporting the stuff after it happens. You don't always feel able to say something in the moment, but as very often happens, it's someone in a van or it's someone on a building site or it's someone standing in a shop doorway. And in any of those cases, you can contact the company afterwards safely and report what's happened to their supervisor. And we've had a lot of really great feedback from people who've done that and it's been taken very seriously. And they've received the message from someone in a position of power over them that it's not acceptable. So that kind of thing, I think, is really, really powerful. Um. Can I, uh, uh, what, what about that? Uh, there was a, a girl just the other week who reported um, a builders yeah. and had the response to the media, I thought, was yeah. rather harsh on her. Yeah. Would you like to make a comment on the response to the media when a young woman who was constantly harassed um, in the end actually reported the builders to the company and the sort of the media, um, um, you know, attitude towards her report? Yeah, I mean, it was such a classic example, I think, of our attitudes towards these kinds of things. You probably saw it, it was the case of Poppy Smart, who was 23 years old, and every day on her walk to work, every day for a month, she was shouted at and harassed from this particular building site, the same set of builders. They whistled at her, they shouted derogatory comments at her, and on one occasion they came out into the street and physically blocked her path. So after a month of it going on every day, she eventually contacted the building company to report it and also contacted the police. And it got into the local and then the national media and the press pretty much universally had it on their front pages as girl calls the police over a wolf whistle. Like that was how they portrayed it. Yes. And you had these massive things on talk shows. They were debating should wolf whistling be um, made illegal? And isn't it disgusting that these women are trying to... And it was just amazing. And for me, that was just so indicative of our attitudes that we want to put the victim on trial in just the same way that we see often <coughs> in these cases in the military. Yeah. We want to ask, what was she doing? What was she wearing? What did she think she was doing speaking up about it? Yeah. And it's so indicative of, of the root of the problem that we see still have this enormous lens on blaming the victim. We act as if it's inevitable, as if it's just something that men do, which is so insulting to the vast majority of men who wouldn't dream of it. And it's a real problem because if you read that in the front page of the paper and yes, you're a absolutely. young woman, you think, well, I'm not going to come forward. Yes. I thought that was particularly uh, poignant because, you know, she's a very young woman and she had such a backlash on just simply reporting it um, to the building company. Anybody else? Is there anybody else who'd like to? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, I was wondering, I mean, a lot of the discussion we've had so far um, has been about sexual uh, persecution mm -hmm. of one kind or another. Um, in the military, uh, what lies at the root uh, of, of a lot of this harassment is lack of respect for women as human beings. Um, so in, in, your, in the play and in some of the social activist stuff, you do you... Do you address respecting women as equals for their brains and their accomplishments, and not just about you know always being about them being sexualized, over sexualized? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think it is all just so caught up in all these different things. And you're right. I think one of the big factors that comes into play with that particular problem is the media and the presentation of women as sex objects as very over sexualized things like page three. And it's very difficult to fight back against that because you're told it's not a big deal. You're often told it's a compliment. Um, the argument with page three was it's just a bit of harmless fun. But it creates that idea, just as you say, about the idea that women are other, that women aren't sort of human beings. And I think that central concept of dehumanizing is key to so much of what we see, whether it's an advert that uses a, you know, a piece of a woman's body to sell a burger without us even being able to see her face, or whether it's an online website that talks about women as sluts and slags and milfs and tramps and hoes and wenches and clunge and gash. You know, all of these words that we have for women that, that don't involve their names. Um, or, or there's currently a lot of websites which target students particularly, which describe women using a number out of 10. Um, you know, so last night I was banging a solid six out of 10 and this happened. Um, so yeah, I really felt that. And I also felt another thing that really struck me in the play that we see hugely in our entries as well, is the combination of different forms of prejudice. 
So a lot of the stories that we get, they're not just from women who are experiencing sexism, they're women who are experiencing sexism intermingled and combined with homophobia or racism or transphobia or ageism or disabledism. And I think we think of these as separate problems, but that's not how people experience them. You don't experience homophobia one day and sexism the next. It's a disabled woman who's told to do a pole dance around her walking stick or it's a black woman who's in a job interview and the interviewer starts talking about how spicy and exotic she is. Uh, or it's an Asian woman who's with her boyfriend and someone shouts at him in the street asking if she's a male or a bride, or a trans woman who's attacked in a public bathroom, or a woman who's out with her partner and finds that people pursue them saying, can I join in, or I've got something that will turn you straight. Um, or older women who again and again use the word invisible in their project entries. And that's been such a powerful thing that's come out of these project entries that these things can't be neatly categorized into separate boxes. And so the solution also has to be intersectional. We have to look at tackling them in ways that take into account those intersections. And I think that was really powerful that that came through in the play as well. I'm going to take one of the uh, entries from Amy. And it says, every day, when we female the male should sound the alarm and speak up as well. So she's talking about yeah. yeah. But it's really important. Um, it is. You know, but in the military, since um, in the um, English military, uh, women uh, represent 10%. It's only 10% of the military is um, female. In the American military, it's 17%. So it's a minority. So um, after you know doing a lot of research on the play and uh, looking at lives of these women, I, my personal viewpoint is that it's got to happen from both both men and women. It cannot just be the women who uh, speak out loudly. They should speak out loudly. However, the men need to be on board in order for change to occur. What yeah, do you feel about that? definitely. I think we need that <coughs> desperately. It's it's something that affects men as well, and that's something the project entry makes so clear, but also it's something that we can't tackle without everyone on board. And it's in everybody's interests on a micro and a macro level. We know that companies with greater diversity on boards perform better. We know that countries where women are more empowered enjoy greater stability. Yeah. And we know that men are ridiculed in the office because they want to take parental leave or congratulated for babysitting their own children. And I think it's really exciting, actually, that the vast majority of men have responded so positively to the project and have said, this has shocked me, this has opened my eyes, I want to get on board. But there's also a minority, and it's, it's funny, actually, with this behind me, I'm so <coughs> conscious of it. And I turn around, I'm constantly worried that there's going to be something horrific up there because my experience of any kind of public event is that usually I'll get home to three or four rape threats or death threats. Oh, really? And well, I've actually the... said I've told them to delete them. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, if there was any trolls out there, I'm afraid they don't have a chance yeah. with PMJ Productions. They've been deleted, so Thanks don't sorry. worry about it. So, on, I think on that note, I'm actually going to uh, conclude the, um, the debate because I'm sure uh, you want to have a drink. Um, so, I'd like to thank Laura Bates for coming um, and uh, being here with us. Um, for the Lonely Soldier Monologues by Helen Benedict. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to uh, uh, the Cockpit Theatre. We really appreciate it. We appreciate the sport. I'd like to thank all the actors who are sitting over there. online. Uh, hi, uh, thank you very much, wherever you may be. I'd love to hear from you. Uh, thank you very much.